So I'll begin by introducing our speaker. Uh, it's Professor Gramasi, who is a professor of statistics at Virginia Tech, and he's also an affiliate faculty in Virginia Tech's computational modeling and data analytics program. And he has been previously an associate professor at the University of Chicago. And I read from his website when I say that his research interests are going quite broadly in Bayesian modeling, um, modeling methodology, methodology, statistical computing, Monte Carlo inference, non-parametric regression, sequential design, and optimization under uncertainty. These are topics that have not been covered so much in the summer school so far, but they are very present in many parts of Fusion. They really complement the standard deep learning uh, discussion that we'll have also later again on Friday. So we're really happy to have you, Professor. Please, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks so much, Francesco. And thanks, Christina, uh, both of you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here virtually and tell you about some of the, some of the research that I've been doing over the last several years. Uh, let me try sharing my screen. Uh, let's see here. Maybe I can get away with just sharing um, the browser window. How does that look? Um, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, great. So this is the, the first slide of my presentation today. Uh, I'm going to go through two different slide decks. One in the first session this morning, it's about 90 minutes and another in the second session, I think there's a 10 minute break in between. So this, this first one is on Gaussian process regression, which um, is probably the canonical surrogate model for modeling simulation experiments. I'm not gonna claim to know a ton about what you do in, in the fusion world, but I believe that you, you must virtualize systems in order to study them before building big apparatuses. And um, the models that I'm gonna to talk to you about this morning are what I think most people use when they work with simulations of virtual systems in order to understand what's going on, in order to optimize things. The second segment this morning, I'll talk about how we do optimization in this framework, um, how, how they uh, understand which um, inputs are driving the, the, the system, the outputs that are ob observed, how to, how to design experiments and so on. So we, we call that surrogate modeling of computer simulation experiments. So this virtualization of a system, we call it a computer experiment in my world. And um, just like with any experiment, a physical experiment, an ordinary statistical experiment, you need to plan those carefully and you need to choose the appropriate modeling apparatus, the appropriate conditions under which to conduct your experiment, and um, you need to analyze its, its outcome in order to learn, in order to perform uh, scientific inquiry. So that's what this is going to be about this morning. Uh, I want, so you have the slide deck. Um, you can click on this to get to my webpage, or you can just Google my name. And I'm going to do that real quick, because I want to show you that um, I've written a book on this topic. So you can click on the link that's right in front. And this book might be of interest to you if you enjoy today's presentation. It's um, a lot more that I'm covering here today. There are 10 chapters. And today I'm only covering um, part of chapter five this morning and then part of chapter uh, seven. The book is free. Um, well, you can buy it too. And I guess I hope you will buy it. But if you, if you don't want to, it's pretty expensive. You can get all these chapters by just clicking on them. You click on uh, this one here and you get um, the book. Um, and you, if you're following along in the book, you can see that a lot of what we're gonna do this morning is right from the very beginning of this chapter. Okay, so I don't wanna scroll through my book. That's not what I came here to do. So let me shut this down and start, start the presentation in earnest. It may be worth um, saying again what we uh, said earlier that Interruptions, questions, uh, welcome during the presentation or at, at the end, right? So definitely, and, and uh, you're using this Discord thing, um, so I expect Francesco or Christina to interrupt me if there's something on there, or, uh, or on the Zoom chat, which I probably also won't be able to see. I'll be in a zone over here. Uh, That's fine. To interrupt yeah. Me. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, what what are my goals for this next? 70 some odd slides. So I want to teach you about the Gaussian process, first as a prior over random functions, 
Um, but then as a, as a predictor, as a posterior over functions given observed data. So I want to teach you about how we do learning in this Gaussian process framework. I think about it as a, a spatial model or as a surrogate model for a computer simulation experiment. But these are popular all over statistics as a general purpose machine learning tool. You can think about it as a competitor to deep learning. It, it predates deep learning. And for some tasks, deep learning has taken over. But for others, and I think in particular, the sorts of science that we do with computer simulations, it is still the canonical approach to modeling those kinds of data. Uh, we'll see that it can get complicated. There's a lot of theory that you could do, statistical theory, mathematical theory, you could do to analyze the properties of what I'm going to show you. But I'm not, by and large, I'm not going to show you that theory. I'm just going to show you how it works in practice and give you some of the intuition involved. In fact, I'm going to argue that it's just a simple extension of ordinary linear regression. It's a nonlinear extension, a spatial extension to ordinary linear regression, which probably you're familiar with. And I think that knowing that is all it takes to make use of it in practice as an almost unbeatable regression tool with good uncertainty quantification properties. I saw that the next um, short course that you're having tomorrow is on uncertainty quantification. Um, and I, I think that, that this is what people like about Gaussian processes, that they, they help you get good UQ. Yeah, that's this afternoon. Um... Udo Van Toussaint will talk about uncertainty quantification, sorry, and modeling and active learning more from a perspective in fusion. Yeah, so I think this, this timing is perfect. All right, so first segment, what is a Gaussian process prior? So first of all, um, you may have heard the term Gaussian process in a different context. People use this term um, for many different things. All it really means is that you have some some instances or some data or some realizations that you're modeling with a Gaussian distribution or with a multivariate Gaussian or multivariate normal distribution. So in that sense, it's very generic. Um, Gaussians are nice because they're completely specified by just two quantities, the mean vector or mean function and covariance matrix or covariance function. So knowing those quantities is all it takes to work with a Gaussian distribution. And so that's all you need to work with a Gaussian process. Um, you'll hear people talk about function spaces, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, and so on. And sometimes those details are important depending on the context. But for what I'm gonna show you, uh, really all that matters is that you have a mean vector and a covariance matrix. So we're working with Gaussian distributions, but somehow we're also working with them in the context of functions. Okay, so, um, what is the Gaussian process that we're going to work with? We're going to work with multivariate normal distributions defined, defined by mean vectors and covariance matrices. But in fact, I'm, I'm really going to focus on the covariance because the covariance is, is what's really important in Gaussian process regression, which is what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to define a notion of covariance in terms of Euclidean distance. So the mo most important thing on this slide is the, the equation right in the middle. I don't know if I can highlight all of it. Yeah, there we go. So I'll, I'm not going to highlight too much because that makes it messy to look at. So I'm thinking about modeling responses or outputs y as a function of inputs x. And I'm going to model them with a Gaussian distribution whose covariance structure is built in terms of distance. In fact, inverse distance. So e to the minus Euclidean distance between the inputs. So the, the outputs are correlated, they covary, and the amount by which they covary is determined by distance in the input space. So covariance in the output space is a function of distance in the input space. This kind of makes sense when you think about it. Things that are closer together in the input configuration space are more similar in the output space. The farther apart they are in the input space, the less related they are to one another in the output space. Okay, so any, any function that, that works like this is fine. You don't even have to have it as a function of distance, um, but distance is common. Uh, you don't have to do e to the minus Euclidean distance. We'll look at some others later. There are many different choices for this family. What's important is that uh, you have a positive definite structure. So that is if you build a matrix from a finite number of example inputs x, 
that that matrix is positive definite. And that's important because we're working with Gaussian distributions. The covariance matrix must be positive definite. But any functional form that gives you a matrix like that is fine. We're going to work with this one because it's simple. It's a great place to start. And we'll generalize a little bit later. But if, there are many ways of generalizing this, and, and I can't go through all of them. Okay, so I'm going to work with this distance-based correlation structure. And I'm going to show you how this distance structure could be used to generate random functions. Okay, so here's a, an algorithm, uh, a bulleted list. It's an algorithm. So I'm going to take a bunch of inputs. Think about a grid in, in one input dimension, maybe, of, of n inputs. And then for all pairs of those inputs, I'm going to calculate their distance and then uh, e to the minus those distances. Those dis distance, <clears throat> excuse me, e to the minus those distances to build a covariance matrix. And then I'm going to put that covariance matrix sigma, that's n by n, into my favorite Gaussian generator with a mean of zero. And then I'm going to get some y values from that generator and plot those xy pairs in the plane, just x and y coordinates. And that's going to give me a random realization of a function. So I'm going to I'm going to take this algorithm and I'm going to execute it. I'm going to execute it in R. R is sort of lingua franca for statisticians. Um, don't don't look too closely at the R code. Uh, maybe you're not familiar with R. That's fine. That's not the point of the code. The point of the code is to show you that it's simple. It's not very many lines. I think you could probably translate it to your favorite language, Python or MATLAB or whatever you use, without too much effort. Um, but what you see is what you get in this talk. It's completely reproducible. The, the pictures and the output that I show you was generated by that code at the time that these slides were built. And you could run it on your own. And sometimes you'll get slightly different results because random numbers are involved. But the spirit should be largely similar when you run it on your own. So I'm, I'm generating um, some x's in a sequence from 1 to 10. So I've created a grid in the input space. I've calculated pairwise distances between them, and then I'm going to do e to the minus distance to build my covariance matrix. I'm being a little bit careful here to ensure positive definiteness by adding a little bit to the diagonal. This isn't essential, but in a re reproducible document such as this, anything that can go wrong will. And so there are some, some guardrails in place to make sure that each time I build this thing, I get something that works. And then I generate from a multivariate normal distribution with that covariance matrix. And then I can take those y values that came out, pair them with the inputs that went in, and plot for you a random one-dimensional function in the xy plane. And that's what's on the next slide. So this would be what people mean by generating from a Gaussian process prior. I've built a covariance structure, in this case using inverse distance. And I've generated y values with that covariance structure and plotted them for you in the xy plane. Of course, this is just a finite realization. This is a function that's visualized by connecting the dots between 100 pairs of points. So it's not, a, it's not really a smooth function. It's, it's just 100 xy pairs that looks like a smooth function because I've connected the dots between them. Um, if I take the limit as the density of the grid goes to infinitely dense, then it, then it is a smooth function. But in practice, um, we don't work with infinity. We work with a finite number of examples. So this is a random function drawn from a Gaussian process prior. What are the properties of this function? Well, you can, you can go to town on this. There are a lot of properties, and there are only a few bullets on this slide. So let's pick off some of the, the easy ones. Um, we're going to get a function that goes from about minus 2 to 2 in the y direction with 95% probability because we generated from a Gaussian distribution whose scale was 1. None of the covariances in that matrix sigma were bigger than 1. So marginally, we're going to go from about 2 times 1 in the negative and positive direction. And you can check that on this graph. Uh, the smallest number is 1 and a half, minus 1 and a half. And the biggest number is about one. So that's one of the properties. Its amplitude is going to be about uh, four, I guess, from minus two to two. We're going to get lots of changes in direction, lots of bumps in the range of the inputs, because 
Um, some of the longer distances in those inputs give very small correlations, and some of the medium distances give pretty high correlations. So if, if we're of distance one apart in the input space, we're going to have a correlation of about 0.4. And if we're of distance four in the input space, we're going to have a correlation of about zero, uh, one times 10 to the minus seven. So that kind of explains why things that are about one unit apart are kind of more highly correlated to one another, and things that are four units apart are in general more, more lowly correlated. So uh, what else? Um, we already talked about extending this out to infinity in the input space. You could show in that case that you'll have a very smooth function. You could talk about it being infinitely mean squared differentiable, um, which is another property that may or may not be appropriate for the functions that you want, but that might be a discussion for another time. Lots of other properties, but those are, the, those are just a few that you can eyeball. Um, here are three more draws from the same Gaussian process, same covariance structure, just three more random functions to kind of give you an idea of the surprise that you might have from your random function. Again, you can see that all of them go from a, you know, no farther apart than minus two to two in the Y space. They all have about the same number of bumps because of that correlation structure, but it's hard to predict in which direction things are gonna go from, from one point to another as you scan from left to right. So you've seen four random functions from the Gaussian process. All right, um, this talk is not really about generating random functions. Uh, I think that there probably are some very good uses for that, but we wanna ask the inverse question. I wanna know if you give me some examples of a function that's of interest to you, maybe you um, built a computer model for your fusion experiment and you ran, you ran some instances of that model under different configurations. So the, the inputs to your code are the Xs, and the outputs that you measured are the y's, and you, and you ran n of those. So you have n examples of your system in different configurations, and you can collect that all, to, all together in a, a matrix or a, a data frame that I'm calling D. So D has your data, and you might want to know what random functions could explain those values. Why would you want to do that? Presumably because the computer simulations that you did were very expensive. So the campaign that you were able to do is limited. That means a relatively small N. And then you would want to be able to predict what would happen in novel instances of your computer code without having to run it. So you might wanna know what is the predictive distribution at new inputs X given the data that you collected. So that's what this talk here is today, today is about. How we use Gaussian processes for that regression problem. So if what I just showed you on the last several slides is the prior, it's, the, it's a way to generate random functions, then this conditional distribution, what functions would you get given the data must be the posterior if you're a Bayesian statistician. You don't need to be a Bayesian statistician to appreciate what I'm about to show you. In fact, all you need to know is an important um, section of the Wikipedia page for multivariate normals, and I'll show you what section that is. The rest is just sort of icing on the cake to help in, with understanding. All right, so I just said that you don't need to be a Bayesian statistician, although some of the vocabulary is ingrained in the literature. Really, all we're doing is regression. So I'm trying to learn about y as a function of x, and the simplest way to do that might be with a least squares linear regression. We are generalizing that a little bit by taking some spatial correlation into account in the input space. And in so doing, we're getting a nonlinear surface. And I'll show that to you. Um, maybe the most important thing about what we are doing is here in bold, there are no parameters in any of the things that I've shown you. I've just postulated that distance is important and that this covariance matrix, which you could think of as as many parameters if you want to. It's n squared parameters for an n by n covariance matrix, but that's a lot of parameters. That's more parameters than you have data examples, which is really what people mean when they say that something is non-parametric. They're not trying to tell you there are no parameters. They're trying to tell you that the number of tunable quantities is as big as or potentially bigger than 
the number of training data points that you have. And that's the situation that we're in. We have a degree of flexibility that is larger than the number of degrees of freedom in our data. All right, so that's a bit of warm up. No tunable parameters in what I'm showing you. How do we use this idea to do regression? All right, the, the idea boils down to something that you can find on a Wikipedia page. I'll just click on this. We, there's a bunch of links in this talk. We won't click on all of them, but I wanna show you that when you do, you get to the thing that I wanna show you. So the thing that I wanna show you is up here at the top. I know that the fonts are maybe a little bit small, but we'll go back to the slides, which have exactly the same information on them. So that the slides um, say that if you have an n-dimensional random vector x and you partition it into two groups, x1 and x2, so without loss of generality, just take the, the first q of them to be in group one and the last n minus q of them to be in group two. So you've partitioned this random vector and you also similarly partition the parameters of the Gaussian distribution. So you par partition the mean vector mu and the covariance matrix sigma into mu is into two groups and sigma is into um, three groups. Actually, there are four, but um, due to symmetry, there's transposes of the same groups on the off diagonals. So I'm partitioning this multivariate normal distribution. And on that Wikipedia page, it says that when you do that, you can, in closed form, get the conditional distribution of one element of the partition given the other. So here I'm, I'm characterizing the, the distribution of x1 given x2. Gaussians are really friendly in this regard. A lot of things that you do with Gaussians tend to give you Gaussian distribution. So if you have a multivariate normal for a vector, it's marginals are multivariate normal. And here I'm showing you how it's conditionals are multivariate normal. So the conditional distribution of x1 given x2 is also Gaussian. It's Q variate Gaussian. And the mean vector is kind of a linear projection. This is a, you don't have to see that. Maybe some of you do see that depending on how often you work with matrices. It's a linear projection of x2 onto x1. And I've got a quadratic reduction in covariance. This is the marginal covariance of x1 is reduced by the conditional covariance of x2 of x1 given x2. So I have a linear projection for the mean and a quadratic reduction in variance. So that kind of represents learning. Whenever variance goes down, I'm, I'm focusing on the minus sign here. Whenever variance goes down, I think of that as a hallmark of learning. I've conditioned on x2, and now I know more about x1. Okay. The amount by which variance goes down um, does not depend on x2, which is kind of a curious thing about Gaussian distribution. So the learning depends on x2, the prediction, but the amount of that uncertainty is decreased. It does not depend on the conditioning variable. That's kind of worth pointing out. All right, how am I gonna use this result from Wikipedia? I didn't come here today to, to point Wikipedia out to you. I'm sure you know about it, but I want to use this result in the context of random functions. So I remember, I wanna know about the predictive distribution of y of x given my data. So let's, let's consider an unobserved n plus first observation. So that's what y of x is gonna be. I don't know what the y variable is, but I do have all these other data examples, yn. And I'm gonna stack them together in a vector. So this is my x from the previous slide, but, but now it's y. I care about the y, so I'll take the data values, that's in one group, and the unknown value, I can't seem to select that, the unknown value in the other group. So I've got a q of one, from the previous slides, and I've got an n, a capital N of little n plus one. And now I'm gonna apply those formulas from the previous slide. The mean is zero, so I don't have to do anything with the mean. The covariance I have to calculate, so I've got the covariance matrix here of the training data observations, hard to select it, training data observations. And then I've got the cross covariances between the testing data location little x and the training data locations, big X. And then I've got the marginal variance of the, the new input, but this is just one following our formulas. Okay, so I built that covariance structure and now I can apply those Wikipedia equations. So here is my application of those Wikipedia equations. My predictive mean 
is a linear projection of the y variables. I'm saying linear projection because I mean that it's linear in terms of linear algebra. But it, of course, it's highly nonlinear in terms of functions of x, because I've got these sigmas involved, and those in, are involving inverse Euclidean distance. So it's going to be a highly nonlinear function mu as a function of little x. But the, the calculations involved are linear projections in this kernel space, this feature space. So this is why people talk about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. But I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to show you how it works. And the variance is also a, a, a reduction. The marginal variance is one, the way we've set it up. And our learning is quadratic in terms of distance in the input space. So the closer my predictive location X is to the training data locations, the more my variance is reduced, the greater my learning is. So I'm going to be more confident about my predictions the closer I am to the training data, which makes sense intuitively, I think. This set of predictive equations has many properties. You can show that it's optimal in a certain sense. People talk about the best linear unbiased predictor or the BLUP. Um, we already talked about some of its properties like reduced variance and, and so on, many other properties. I don't want to go through the list of them. Um, let's see what this looks like in action. Okay. Can I ask um, a question oh, really quick? Yeah, sure. Just for comprehension. Um, so on that last slide, the that variance is going to be a scalar, right? At this point. That's a yes, it's a scalar. So I have one input location x, although it's arbitrary. And for every x, I get a, a scalar mean and a scalar variance. Okay, thank you. Right. In fact, the next slide is I forgot about this. I was ready to go on to the example, but I, I forgot I had this slide in there. You can do this um, wholesale for many locations at once if you want to. So if you have a whole grid of inputs where you want predictions, if I call that grid capital calligraphic X, so suppose that grid has n prime coordinates in it, you can do these equations for all of them at once. And then it's not a, it's a vector. I get a mean vector and a covariance matrix. Um, so you can do this for one point or you can do it for many points at once. Okay. Thanks for that question. Definitely interrupt me just like that if you want to. I'm cool with that. All right, so now I want to do, I want to follow that algorithm from the previous slides in code. Again, it's our code. Um, I can point to some of it because it's intuitive. Like I can show you that my training data is um, eight points in one dimension. And my response, my, my computer simulation, if you will, is sine of x. So you have to suppose you don't know it's the sinusoid. That's a very uninteresting computer simulation, but nice for pictures in, the, in this early stage of the talk. I need to calculate pairwise distances and exponentiate them. And then I need a predictive grid. So suppose I now make a, a testing grid um, that's of length 100, covering the, a similar range of the input space. I need distances between those locations, and I need to exponentiate them. And here's the most important bit. I need to, to measure distance between, between the training and testing sets because that's what drives learning. It's this distance between inputs in the input space that are in the conditioning set and in the new set, and I need to exponentiate those. So now I have all of the quantities that are involved in that multivariate normal conditioning, and I just need to do it. I need to do the linear projection, and I need to do the quadratic reduction in variance. So these two, bits of code, two lines, right? Matrix vector products and differences are my implementation of these two equations on two slides back. So once I've built the relevant quantities, I really just have two lines of code, maybe may complicated matrix vector products, but it doesn't take very many characters to code it up. These are just, this is R's way of doing matrix vector products. In Python and MATLAB, it's a little simpler. And once I have those quantities, I can do all sorts of stuff with them. I can plot the means as a function of x. Um, if I want to look at covariance, this is a little bit harder. My favorite thing to do is to just generate y values under a Gaussian distribution and plot those. That's what I'm going to do. Another thing you could do is look at the diagonal of the covariance matrix, which is the marginal variance. And I can get quantiles from that to get error bars. 
So I'm going to plot all these things for you on the next slide. And here it is. So let's let's um, pick apart this picture. So the training data are the black dots. I have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight examples of my computer model, examples of the sinusoid. And I've used those to train the Gaussian process through its covariance matrix and its projection onto the testing set. The mean vector is one of the lines. That's the black line. So the black line is the, is the means. And you can see that's very close to the truth, which is in blue. The, the blue one is, let's see, where is that? Just the truth, the true sinusoid is in blue. So very accurate from just eight, um, eight examples. Each one of the gray lines is one of those random uh, realizations from the conditional distribution. So each gray line is, is an example of a function that kind of agrees with the training data. It's a sample from the posterior distribution or from the conditional distribution. You can see that most of them are very close to the truth, but there's variability in that multivariate normal. So some of them swing quite wildly. If I want to capture that uncertainty, I could look at the, the quantiles of that distribution, and that's what's shown in red. So red is capturing my error bars, if you want to call them that. All sorts of visual things in this plot. Um, sometimes people talk about the football-shaped surface, and they're looking at they're looking at this, right? This looks like an American football, not a not a the rest of the world football, but it's kind of like an American football. Um, some people call this a sausage. It does. No matter where you're from, this kind of looks like a sausage, right? It's got links connecting it. So this these shapes are a hallmark of Gaussian process regression because it's a very intuitive form of uncertainty. I don't have any uncertainty nearby my training data because I've assumed that these data are not noisy. Don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add noise in just a minute. And I've got an organic expansion and uncertainty at the midpoint between two training data locations. That's where my uncertainty is maximized in, in the nearby region um, at the midpoint between them. And then as I move closer, the uncertainty reduces and the amount by which it reduces is a quadratic function of distance. And I've got the most uncertainty at the edges of the input space, which makes sense. That's, I have the fewest nearby examples. My distances in the input space to the rest of the training data is largest at the edges. So I have the highest uncertainty there. On the next slide, I have a list. Um, this list is things that I said already. I'm just supposed to make sure I didn't forget to say anything. Um, so my predictive surface interpolates the data. Why? Because my correlations are perfect if I get to identities in the input space. Uh, the, the variance as a football or sausage shape the error bars get really wide outside the data range. Um, here's something I didn't say. The, the predictive mean is mean reverting away from the training data. Let's see that. You can see that the edges, my predictive mean is bending, even though there are no training data examples to bend to. Where is it bending to? It's bending to zero, because I said that my Gaussian had a mean of zero to start out with. So in the absence of training information nearby, it's going to re revert to that quantity. And the same thing is happening with the variance. It's, it's, it's going to expand out to two eventually. And in, in, in this plot, it's only going to about one. But if I were to go out to negative five or something like that, it would have, those error bars would eventually go to two in both directions, because that's what I said to start out with was my marginal variance. Um, what? Uh, what does this mean? So this means that you can't trust extrapolations too far outside the range of the training data. However, at least its behavior is not un unpredictable. So if you knew something about the mean and the variance outside the data range, you could put that into the Gaussian. Or if you don't, you can just know that it's going to go there away from the training data. So all of these features make this a really popular non-parametric, non-linear regression tool. It's accurate. It has good uncertainty quantification. All right. Um, maybe you're not satisfied by this one-dimensional regression. 
actually dimension, input dimension has nothing to do with it. None of the things that I showed you involve the input coordinates directly. All that matters is the relative distance between them. So as long as I can calculate distances in the input space, I can do this idea. Now for these slides, it's easier to show you things in 1D and 2D because it's easy to make pictures, right? So I'm only gonna go to two dimensions for now, but by the end of the slide deck, we'll get up into higher dimension and you'll see that the principles are the same. So here, I wanna go back through the first 20 slides or so with a two dimensional example. It won't take us 20 slides. We'll be able to do it in five or six, but the idea is to kind of go backwards and show you that it's, there's nothing special about two dimensions. So I'm gonna work on a grid in 2D. This is a 20 by 20 grid. I'm gonna calculate distances and exponentiate them. So this code is cut and paste from before, except for the grid in the first few lines. And then I can plot those random functions for you. So here's two random functions in 2D. Harder to visualize in 2D, but um, there's some random functions that come from a Gaussian process prior. If I have some data, then I can do conditioning. So here's some data, and there's 40 examples. In higher dimension, you tend to need more data to learn what's going on because it's more nuanced in higher dimension, but otherwise the principles are the same. Here's the true response surface. So Y is X1 times E to the minus X1 squared minus X2 squared. So highly nonlinear surface and that I have 40 examples of for training. And I wanna be able to make predictions on a dense grid. So this is a 40 by 40 grid. So I don't know, what, what's that, 1600 or something? So I, I wanna um, expand that out to a dense grid. I need distances between the training data locations, distances between the testing data locations and distances between them. Again, this is the most important part, the distances between them, because that's what drives learning. And then I can do my my two linear algebra calculations. So this is identically cut and paste, right? The input dimension has nothing to do with it. I just need to do a linear projection in inverse distance space and a quadratic reduction in variance between those pairs of inputs. Visualization, again, is a little harder in 2D than 1D. So I'm gonna to have to decide what to show you. What I'm gonna show you is the mean surface and the standard deviation surface. Okay, that's what's on the next slide. So this is my mean surface. The function is lower here, higher here, and, and zero basically everywhere else. So this is a, in this heat plot, red colors are, are cooler, uh, white, yellow colors are higher or hotter. This is the mean surface. This is the standard deviation surface. You can see it's red near the training data, lower, right? The sausage is pinching where it's red at the training data points and the sausage is expanding away from the training data points. It's more yellow and white where I don't have examples. So I have an organic summary of my uncertainty, which is lower where I have data or nearby to there and higher where I don't have data farther away. All right, so here's another view. I've decided to use a perspective to show the mean function because that's maybe a little bit prettier you can see that I've estimated a, a highly nonlinear surface from these examples and projected it onto a grid or a mesh. So there is in a few slides, everything that we did to start out with, which was in one dimension, now in two dimensions. Where do we go from here? I think that I'm gonna throw a number out there. I'm gonna say that that's 90% of Gaussian process regression. But as you might imagine, the, the last 10% takes like 90% more of the effort, right? So that you have most of it, that's the idea, but you can embellish it, embellish it in many ways. And the reasons for doing that is because not all regression tasks um, fit nicely into the framework that I just showed you. So what's one obvious thing? Uh, data can be noisy. So you might not want to interpolate, you might want to smooth, so that's one variation that we'll need to entertain. Not all functions have, uh, not all of them go from minus two to two. Uh, amplitude of two is not quite right. The amplitude of what I showed you is four. 
but the, you might want to expand the scale of your outputs beyond what I just showed you. Not all functions are amenable to equal decay in all directions. So you might not have a radial distance that you want to use as a, to, to build your functions. We might want to generalize that. And finally, even the most smooth physical relationships are rarely infinitely smooth. One of the most common examples of a computer simulation experiment involves solving coupled systems of differential equations. That's, that's the classic example. So you've got some kind of solver. Think about a runge kata or something like that, or, or, or Euler solver that's solving systems of differential equations. And um, they might be computationally intensive to do so. And, but you might not want to treat it as a black box, right? Because you have differential equations, you know something about the smoothness of the solutions, even if you don't know the exact values that will come out of your simulator. And rarely is the smoothness infinitely smooth. Often these system, systems of differential equations are, are, are two or three times differentiable, and you might want to, to change your, your Gaussian process to suit that. So I'm going to take you through the first three of these. The last one's, uh, there, there's stuff in the book on that if you want to see it, uh, but we'll, we'll run out of time before we can get to everything. All right, so we address each of these nuances with what I call hyperparameters. What's a hyperparameter? It's just an ordinary parameter. Um, so I'm going to introduce a quantity that needs to be tuned, but we call them hyperparameters instead of just parameters to remind you that most of the flexibility comes from the multivariate Gaussian structure, from those pairwise distances. It doesn't come from these tunable quantities. And we'll see that, in fact, we get a good result even if we don't tune them. So they have kind of a subtle effect on what's going on, which is different than linear regression. Right? The parameters in linear regression are fundamental. If you don't learn the right slopes, then you're not going to get good predictions. If you don't learn the right parameters in this Gaussian process context, you're probably still going to get good predictions because that's not where the dynamic information is coming from. It's coming from the distances. All right, so let me um, let me tackle each one of these things in turn. So suppose the easiest one to do first is the scale. So suppose you wanted to model a random function whose amplitude was larger than two. So here's what you could do. You could introduce a parameter. I'm going to call it tau squared that adjusts the scale of the Gaussian correlation function. Okay, so my correlation matrix is still sigma, but now I'm going to have this extra parameter tau squared. And the part we were using before, which is to do with distance, that was getting us correlations as a function of distance, is going to be um, C. So C is the same thing I had before, but now my covariance matrix sigma is tau squared times C. And this parameter might be tunable, um, or at least I can specify it to start out with and think about how I might learn it from data. So I've introduced this scale tau squared. Let, let me just check that that does the trick. So if I put a tau squared of 25 in, the square root of that is 5. And I should get functions that go from about minus 10 to 10, minus 2 times 5 to plus 2 times 5. And if I generate, here's one example, it, it seems to do the trick, right? It goes from about, this one goes from minus 5 to 15. But keep in mind, it's a random function. It can go outside the range of minus 10 to 10 um, with low probability. And this one does. It goes about to 15, but it doesn't go quite as far as minus 10. It goes to minus 5. You could try this at home, and you'll get a different random function. But most of the time, it'll go from about minus 10 to 10. All right, but who cares about generating data? What we want is to be able to learn from examples about a function on any scale. So let's see if we can do that. But before, before we go about learning this parameter, let's entertain what would happen if we had data with an amplitude of five, but we didn't know that, and we used exactly the code from earlier to learn from that data. So I've cut and pasted that code. Everything is cut and pasted from before. The only difference is that my training data have a higher amplitude. I took the sine function and I multiplied it by five. And I'm just asking what would happen if the true data had an amplitude 
of um, that went from minus five to five instead of minus one to one. Okay, here's what happens. I still learn. I'm still going to get very accurate predictions, but I'm going to get something wrong. But the thing I'm getting wrong is the uncertainty. So I've, I, I, can get, I can get the function on that scale because I'm just going to be smoothing those data values. The data values go as high as 5 and as low as minus 5. So I smooth them. But the thing that I'm compromising on is uncertainty. So if I get the scale wrong, I'm assuming a scale of 1, but the data have a scale of 4, I become overconfident. That's not, not such a bad thing. This is why we call them hyperparameters, right? You get them wrong and things aren't going to be perfect, but they're not going to be a disaster. They're still going to get pretty good predictions. All right, so here's a slide where I'm supposed to remember uh, everything I was supposed to say on the previous slide. So I get the mean about right, but I've got the wrong prior, so I'm overconfident. I get the scale wrong, and I have predictive intervals that are too narrow. Also, I'm mispredicting at the edges. I forgot to point that out. The truth is going outside the interval here at the edges. So in particular, when I revert to the prior, which is the thing that was wrong, I get pretty uh, bad predictions. But everywhere else, my predictions are OK. okay. So how, how do we do it right? How do we estimate the scale, which I'm calling a hyperparameter, because its impact is going to be subtle? I'm getting good predictions already. I just want to make things a little bit better by getting the scale right. So as with any unknown parameter, I have choices when it comes to tuning it. In statistics, we call that estimation, right? But really what we're doing is we're fiddling this knob until it's about right. And there are so many different ways that you can fiddle a knob so that it makes things better, right? In statistics, we have um, method of moments. Maybe you've heard of that. We have the likelihood. We can maximize the likelihood, or we could do Bayesian posterior inference. Another statistical method is cross-validation. Um, this last one is maybe not a statistical method, but you know, if you go, it's not a bad idea, right? I can look back at this function and be like, oh yeah, I used a prior of one, but my function is going from minus four and a half to four and a half. So maybe I could use a scale that's that gives me a number closer to four and a half. That's not a super statistical method, but it's probably going to work. So th this eyeball norm um, might work out great. It's not automatable. It's not really reproducible because you'd do it differently than I would, but it's not necessarily a bad idea. I'm going to use the likelihood. In fact, I'm going to maximize it because that's easier to do in code. But Bayesian inference is also not a bad idea. OK, so what is the likelihood? Um, the likelihood has got to be Gaussian. And I, I said my data y were Gaussian with unknown parameter tau squared and distance based correlation structure c. So that's what the likelihood is. Um, if you read textbooks on this, they will add a lot of caveats to that. Some will call this what I'm showing you the marginal likelihood. Um, and it is a marginal likelihood of sorts, but getting into the details of that is a bit of a distraction. Uh, I prefer to just say that y is Gaussian, so its PDF comes from a Gaussian distribution. If you Wikipedia multivariate normal, you'll see a PDF that looks just like this. This is a PDF for a mean of zero. So if your mean's not zero, it'll little, look a little different. Um, but this is the mean zero Gaussian probability density function. And the logarithm of that is easy to calculate by hand. We usually work with the logarithm when maximizing the likelihood because it has better numerical conditioning. Also, the calculus is easier if you're taking derivatives. And that's what we're going to do. So to maximize that likelihood, I just differentiate it with respect to the unknown quantity, which is tau squared, set it equal to 0, and solve. And I can do that analytically uh, with pen and paper. So I find out that my estimate of tau squared is a kind of quadratic form that involves the y values. Um, if you're doing a Bayesian approach, you get a very similar answer under a certain class of priors. I don't want to say too much more about that. Uh, this is kind of a rhetorical question here at the end of the slides. All right, so now um, I have a new set of predictive equations that involves my estimated scale. So I'm going to plug in my tau squared 
into my predictive equations. Here it goes right out front of my variance. And now I have the ability to make predictions with an estimated scale. So these equations are cut and paste from 10 or 15 slides back. The only difference is that I've plugged in this quantity. It does not factor into the predictive mean at all. I've represented these equations as being Gaussian, but in fact, they're not. Whenever you estimate a scale, you turn a Gaussian into a T. So technically, the predictive equations are student T, but we kind of tend to ignore that in, in my world. We're usually working with a big enough N to where the degrees of freedom is large and the T is well approximated by a Gaussian. But there are folks that use T distributions instead. It's just a little bit more work. All right, let me um, plug that value into my predictive equations. I'm estimating it. Here's the, the code that estimates it, following the, the formula two slides back. And then I can put it in to my variance when I calculate the predictive covariance matrix. And then I can plot the same thing that we plotted the first time that we looked at this sign data. And you can see it's essentially the same picture now as the first time we did it. But the difference is that I have a longer y-axis. My uncertainty or my function is going from minus six to six now, instead of minus one to one. So I've, I've, done the, I've learned the correct scale of my function, which has fixed all of my error bars. All right, one, one down, uh, two to go. What if my data is noisy? To handle noise in this context, I need to break the perfect correlation that comes as my input locations get closer together. Remember, look, let's look at this surface, right? As, as I get closer to a training data location, my correlation goes to one and my variance goes to zero. That's what allows me to interpolate the data. But if I don't want to interpolate the data, if I want to smooth it instead, smooth some noisy values, then I need to make it so the correlation doesn't go to zero as I get closer to the training data. Okay, so it, it says right now we have a correlation structure that goes to one as the X's get closer together. So if I want to break that, I can just nudge it in the, some direction and make it not go to one, right? I make it go to 1.5 instead. So that's really what I've coded up here. I'm gonna create a new structure that's the same as the old structure, but it gets a little bump when the distances go to zero. So as the points approach each other, I don't, I don't get perfect correlation of one, I get one plus something, which kind of doesn't make any sense, right? Correlations should be no bigger than one. And you can rewrite this so that that's true. Just any kind of bump works. This is the simplest thing to do, to break perfect correlation by making it bigger than one, which means you can't call it a correlation any, anymore, but it still works. I've represented this as a Dirac delta function, but in fact, um, when you code it up, what you're really doing is using a Kronecker delta function. We're gonna code it up, so that's what I'm gonna write up. So when I'm building my covariance matrices, when I'm doing my functions of um, ki of x, k of xi and xj, I'm gonna add a little bit when the inputs are the same. So when I calculate k of xi, xi, it's one. This is gonna be one plus this number. All other times, it's just as it was before. So I don't add a little bit. The little bit I'm calling g. The reason I'm calling it g is because this idea comes from spatial statistics and they called the parameter the nugget. So this is the nugget parameter. We already have, nugget starts with n, right? But we already have an n. So I'm taking G because Nugget has two Gs. I don't know why this is the, the common letter, but that's why I think Nugget has two Gs. So the parameter is called G. Okay, so I'm adding G to the diagonal of this covariance structure. So again, I have a multivariate normal distribution, unknown scale, and a covariance structure that has an extra G amount on the diagonal. So you could write that in matrix form as tau squared times a distance-based structure plus G times the identity. So the diagonal of this covariance matrix is bigger than one, bigger than one by an amount G. How are we going to learn the right amount G? We're gonna do it exactly the same way. 
that we did it for the other parameter. We're going to maximize the likelihood. I can find the MLE for tau squared as a function of G, and then I can plug that in and I get an expression that only has one unknown. That one unknown is G, and now I can maximize it Turns out that I can't do that in closed form. I can take the derivative, but I can't solve. I can't set that equal to zero and solve. So I'll need a numerical solver for this quantity that I'm optimizing. All right, um, I'm just gonna use a numerical solver. That's always the best way to start out, I think. You wanna optimize something, just put it, just code it up. I'm gonna code up my negative log likelihood. So this is my, coded expression. I don't want to stare at it too much for this quantity at the bottom. That's what I want to optimize. So I put it into a function and now I can put that function into an optimizer. Um, so here we go. I'm going to take some data. Let's do, here's my data, five sine of x plus noise. So now I've got noisy data and I'm going to put this function into my favorite R optimizer. My favorite opt R optimizer is called optimize. And it's gonna come back and give me a value that I can use. Now I can plug that value into my predictive equations um, and do the usual thing, right? I, this, this is the same linear algebra we've always been using, but now my covariance structure has this estimated quantity on the diagonal and I can plot for you on the next slide. So here is my noisy training data. I've made it obvious that it's noisy by gathering two values at each input, right? Each time I run it, I get a different value. It's following the sine function, but it's noisy. Um, this value is above the mean, uh, the, above the truth, and this one's below the truth. Both of these are below the truth. This has one above and one pretty close to it and so on. So you can see that I've smoothed these data because it's noisy, I, it's harder to learn, right? I don't get the right answer quite as often, but in general, my error bars seem to capture the truth. There's one part of it where my 95% error bars do not cover the true value, but you can see that some of my simulations are pretty close to the truth. Francesco, remind me what we're go how far we're going to time-wise. I think until 11.30. East, so another yeah. 30 minutes. Oh, this is perfect. We're going to make if you, it. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Um, so I, I did a brute force optimization. I just coded up the objective that I wanted to minimize. Um, and I didn't use any extra information. But there is, of course, there is extra information that I could use. I could use the derivatives of the log likelihood that I was maximizing. Why would I want to do that, right? I, I can look at how many times my function was evaluated. It was evaluated 17 times to maximize the likelihood. I might wonder if I could get an answer quicker or more reliably if I used more information. So I can, I can calculate derivatives of my log likelihood. There are two important identities that are useful when doing derivatives of these log likelihoods because they involve covariance matrices. You need to differentiate through the inverse and through the determinant, why? I can point back at why, right? Where's the formula? Here's the formula that I'm optimizing as a function of the parameter G, and I have to do it. There's a G inside this covariance matrix, and there's a G inside this one too. So I need to differentiate through an inverse and a determinant. And these are some nice identities that show you how to do that. Um, I framed them generically in terms of a parameter phi. We're going to use it for G, and we're going to use it for another parameter in a minute. Okay, so here is my math. Uh, I won't take you through it. You can check my work that takes the derivative of that function with respect to G, and then on the bottom is the, the final expression. So it's a pretty tidy expression, the derivative of the log likelihood. And I can code that up. So here's my six or seven line function that codes up that derivative in R. And now I can put it into my favorite derivative-based optimizer. I like BFGS for my derivative-based optimization. And in R, there's a function called optim that supports BFGS-based um, numerical optimization with derivatives. So here we go. I've, uh, I've used optim 
and it's come back and given me the estimate of my nugget parameter. And I'm comparing that to the value I got before. This is the value I got last time, and it's pretty much the same. So I'm getting pretty much the same answer both ways. Uh, I probably trust the derivative-based one more because it's not approximating as many things. So that's why they're not identical numbers, but they're pretty similar numbers. And, and here I can see that it, I was able to solve the problem in fewer evaluations. Uh, maybe not an impressive amount fewer. 14 isn't that much better than 17. But I'm going to show you that as things get more complicated, as I start introducing more embellishments in this framework, the derivatives can be quite helpful in terms of speed of the optimization. OK, um, what else can we do? Uh, we've, we've done two of the three things I said we would do. So we tackled scale and noise. Now I want to calculate, I want to um, tackle de decay of correlation as a function of distance. So my, my, my function before was just e to the minus Euclidean distance. But now I'm going to parameterize that. I'm introducing a parameter theta that scales distance. So, so maybe the function is uh, very wiggly, which means that correlation should decay quickly as a function of distance. Or maybe it's very flat or subtly curved, which means that correlation should decay slowly as a function of distance. So I'm introducing a hyperparameter that would allow us to learn that. If the hyperparameter is large, then the function is varying slowly. If the hyperparameter is small, then the function is wiggly. It's varying quickly. This family of correlation functions is called the isotropic Gaussian kernel. So people talk about kernel functions with Gaussian process uh, regression. This is a kernel function that's called the Gaussian, not because it's for Gaussian processes. This is kind of a misnomer. Um, it's not Gaussian because of Gaussian processes. It's just Gaussian because it looks like a Gaussian density. It's got a squared term, and it's got a, a, a standard deviation or variance term. You can use a non-Gaussian looking kernel with a Gaussian process. This isn't where it gets its Gaussianity from. It's just a distance-based kernel, squared Euclidean distance. All right, how do you do inference for this unknown parameter? Um, well, the first way is to do it brute force, I think. You just need to build your likelihood that uses that parameter and then maximize it. So I, this is exactly the same function we optimized before, but now it has two parameters instead of one. And when I build my kernel, I use both of those parameters. Otherwise, the function is the same as before. So I've got a theta in the denominator of squared distance, and I've got a g on the diagonal. Otherwise, the function is exactly the same as the one we optimized last time. Um, so let's use this on our 2D example. Just for fun, I'm alternating between the 1D and 2D examples, and I'm still observing with noise. So I've got noisy data, and I want to see if the length scale, uh, sorry, this is, I should have said this parameter theta is called the length scale because it determines the, the length at which the correlation function decreases as a function of distance. All right. So let's use this data to learn um, the unknown parameters. So I have two of them. I have, uh, I have the length scale, which I've learned is one, which is what we were using before, by the way. So what we had before was pretty good. And I've got a nugget, a G of 0 0.08, 0 0.008. And finding this answer requires 90 evaluations of the function. It takes, it, it does 18 iterations, but I need to use finite differencing to approximate derivatives because I didn't give it the derivatives. And that finite differencing expands the number of evaluations out to 90. Okay, uh, let's look at what the predictive surface is. This is code cut and paste from earlier with the estimated parameters plugged in. And you can see they look very similar. So visually not much difference, even though this time the data was learned, was, was um, sampled with noise. So I've separated the signal from noise here. I like to think about this length scale as, as covering the signal 
and the nugget is covering the noise. If the, if the function is changing very rapidly, it can be difficult to disentangle those two things. Is the variability that I'm seeing due to signal or due to noise? This Gaussian process has learned that this variability here is due to signal, and the variability that I had elsewhere is due to noise. So I've got a flat region with some noisy observations, and I have a bumpy region also with some noisy observations. And I still have uncertainty that is lower if I'm closer to the training data locations and higher if I'm farther away. All right, can we do better? Yes, again, you can do better if you give more information. If you give the optimizer derivatives with respect to both parameters, then it will find the answer faster. So here are the derivatives that you would need with respect to the new parameter, theta, with respect to the length scale. And then I can plug that into my optimizer. I can form a gradient with respect to both unknown parameters. I can do my calculations first for the length scale and then for the nugget and return a vector value derivative or gradient. And when I plug that into my optimizer, it gives me basically the same answer when I do it with gradients compared to without. Those are identical numbers in this case. So why do you do it? You do it because it saves you on compute time. I only had to evaluate the function 10 times to find the optimum compared to the 90 that I needed before. All right, last thing. Here's the last thing I'm gonna do in this introductory segment. I worked in 1D and I worked in 2D and I said I would do a bigger example. So here's one where I'm gonna do 7D. Okay, I can do more than that. Um, people use this for, I'd say, up to 20 dimensions without much uh, modification. You can do higher than that too, but then you're starting to get to kind of the frontier of what people do. So here's, a, a, here's an example function that I call the Friedman function. Jerry Friedman is a famous statistician from Stanford, and he wrote a paper in the 90s on a method that's called MARS. We don't need to talk about what MARS is. But in that paper, he concocted this function that he thought would be an interesting challenge problem for nonlinear regression. And here's the function. This is the es essence of the function right here. So the, the output is 10 times sine of x1 times x2, 20 times x3 squared, and 10 times x4, 5 times x5. So it's, it's oscillating in two of the inputs in their product actually. It's quadratic in one and it's linear in two. And he also gave the ability to evaluate the function with more inputs that were ignored. So I said we were gonna work in 7D. The function is in fact only a, only a function of five inputs, but I can give it two more noise inputs and, and check whether or not I can learn that those inputs are noise or not. The function is set up so that the inputs are generated randomly and the outputs are also generated with noise. So here down at the bottom, I can make a training set of 200 points in seven dimensions. And I, that's my training set. And then I have a testing set of a thousand points in seven dimensions. So I can calculate my accuracy out of sample. Okay, so let's take this data and put it into our optimizer. This is really just cut and paste. Same negative log likelihood and gradient that we coded up earlier, same optimization function, different data set. Right? The thing that's different is here. I put in my distances and my Y values, and it comes back and it gives me a theta hat and a G hat. It takes 27 evaluations of the log likelihood and its gradient to find that answer. Okay. Now I need to make the predictions. Now that I've got those hyperparameters, I make the predictions. These are all cut and paste from before. Lots of code on the slide, not lots, 10 lines, let's say, but they were all lines that we looked at earlier. They're all cut and paste. Um, hard to visualize in seven dimensions. So let's, instead of trying to make pictures, let's try to compare it, compare our accuracy, let's say, to something else. So what, what are we gonna compare them to? You could compare them to the 
the method that the data was designed to work on, you could compare it to Mars. So in, in R, there's a there's several Mars implementations. Um, this one here, this Mars function is in the MDA package. So I can get a Mars fit and a prediction. And then I can compare out of sample on my testing set how accurate it is. Here I'm looking at root mean squared error. So this is squared distance between the truth and the prediction um, averaged and then square rooted. And you can see that smaller numbers here are better. You want to be closer to the truth. And the Gaussian process that we fit has an RMSC of 1.2 and Mars has an RMSC of 1.6. So this is more accurate than another method. You can, if you repeat this over and over again, get different results. Every once in a while, Mars wins. You get a random data set and it's slightly better. I encourage you to try that if you want. You can cut and paste this code and see um, how often the Gaussian process wins. All right, can you do even better? And the answer to that is yes. Why is it possible to do better and what are we gonna do? So let, let's go backwards. Um, here's the true function. Remember I said it's um, sinusoidal in X1 and X2, quadratic in X3, and linear in X4 and X5. Um, you wouldn't ordinarily know this about your function, right? You, you're, I'm imagining you've got a computer simulation and you, you know a little bit about how it's built, but you wouldn't be running a computer simulation experiment if you knew a lot about how the function was going to come out. But there's one kind of uh, stylized fact, I guess, about um, computer experiments that I think are encapsulated in this function. And that's, that stylized fact is that the inputs interact differently with the response. And this says that, right? Some of them are periodic and some of them interact. Some of them are not periodic, but still nonlinear. And some of them have very simple relationships with the response. I think that as a caricature, that's often true. You might not know which are which, but to say that there's heterogeneity in the way the inputs affect the response is, is probably almost always true. So maybe it doesn't make sense to treat all of the inputs equally when it comes to calculating distance-based correlations. So that's the next idea. The next idea, is to allow each input coordinate to affect correlation differently. And we can do that by introducing a different parameter, theta, a different rate of decay of correlation for each input coordinate. So it's like I'm vectorizing this length scale parameter. And then I need to learn each of the coordinates of that vector, each one for each input dimension. So this is called the separable or anisotropic Gaussian kernel. Separable because this e to the minus sum is really a product, right? e to the minus sum is a product of e's. That's what people mean when they say you can separate it, that you can factorize the function as a product. Anisotropic because isotropy means the same in every direction, but this is not the same in every direction. The idea is that it could be different in each direction. So it's a, a form of anisotropy. Okay. How Can I ask a you... quick question actually sure. about that? Mm -hmm. Is um, the, the fact that it's separable, I mean, of course, this the, that property is very convenient, but in some cases we want to do inference and find that the parameters have some correlations and those correlations are really interesting. Is it completely unreachable to consider? I mean, in some context using priors that are non-separable is feasible. In the context yes. of Gaussian process regression, is that considered? Yes, it is. You know, like I said at the start, there are so many different ways you can model this correlation structure. We're looking at the very simplest because, because we're introducing it, um, but you can go to town on this. You can have um, linear dependence between the different coordinates of X. You can have, um, you can have periodic behavior. You can introduce correlations in many different ways. Okay, and the, the beauty of Gaussian processes remains. It That's doesn't right. destroy the simplicity. Okay, Yes. Okay. thanks. Okay, so how do you do inference? Same idea, right? You, you, you just work with the log likelihood and you throw it into your optimizer and you might choose to give it derivatives. Okay, and the derivatives are calculated in very similar ways. This is very similar to the formula we had a few slides back. 
involving differentiation through the kernel structure. Um, before we do derivatives, um, I, I, I'm going to do it brute force. I'm just going to put it into my likelihood, and I'm going to put it into the optimizer. So the likelihood is, is one line different than the one we had before. Now I'm using a vectorized theta parameter, and, um, and now I have more things to optimize. So my optimizer is going to have to learn uh, eight quantities for this problem. We have seven length scales and one nugget. So I put it into the optimizer and give it my, uh, my objective function, which is the negative log likelihood and, and my data. And it comes back and gives me the estimates of the eight parameters. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The last one is the nugget and the rest are the length scales. And it's interesting to look at these length scales. Usually they're nonsense parameters. They're just you know, tuning something. But you can see that the last um, three, actually the last four, are about as large as I'm allowing. I'm allowing them to get as big as 10. And the last four are coming back as 10. So this is telling me that the last four columns of my input space are not affecting the response much, which I know is correct. I know the last two don't at all. And I know that the last, the, the, the fourth and the fifth one contribute linearly. So they have no curvature. So this is telling me the last four inputs don't provide any curvature to the response, which is correct. Um, the first three do, they're much smaller. That means the rate of decay of correlation is greater as a function of distance. This come, it comes at quite some expense. I have a seven dimensional optimization eight dimensional, excuse me, eight dimensional optimization. So I have to evaluate my criteria almost 2000 times. And that takes 14 seconds to do. 14 seconds isn't an eternity, I know. It's still not very long, um, but it's quite a bit of work to get through all of those gradient approximating evaluations, all those finite differencing that goes along with approximating a derivative when you don't give it derivative information. But we, we can give it derivative information. We can differentiate that log likelihood and return a gradient that has eight components. And this is the code that does that. It returns a gradient with eight components. And when you use that derivative information, you get more or less the same answer. So here's the gradient answer versus the previous one. The numbers aren't identical. It's a different optimization method. They're trying to go to the same place. And you can see they more or less do go to the same place. But I trust the gradient one more. When you're using gradients, you're not approximating anything. I'm not using tangents to approximate derivatives anymore. So I'm able to get a more reliable result. Not only is it more reliable, but it requires fewer evaluations. That's a factor of 10, right? Well, yeah, it's a factor of 10, more or less, fewer. And as a result, it's also faster. So we're talking about six seconds now instead of 14. I ask for a, a clarification on this these number tens that you're obtaining here, you're, you're saying that that's the, the fact that you're basically reaching the bound that you set indicates that those parameters are not constrained. But normally, if you hit the bound, it also means that your bound is not actually good, that you are going against, that the data is telling you something that you are not allowing. Yes. Can you explain why your intuition here is that that's not the case? All right, two, two things. One thing is that, um, Many of my choices in this slide deck are to, to make it work reproducibly every time I build it. So you could choose a larger number, 100, 1,000. Um, that will probably work. I just, you know, I, I've discovered that these values that I put in give me, every time I run it, even with random data, they give me sensible results every time. As you start to allow this number to get bigger, like start putting in hundreds and thousands and so on, you make it potentially numerically unstable because you're working with matrices and those matrices involve e to the minus distance and you could convert your theoretically positive definite covariance matrix into a numerically non-positive definite one. So that's the, like, that's the risk here. It's not a statistical risk, it's a precision, it's a numerical precision risk. Um, so you Why can't, it? what's that? I was wondering why doesn't the optimization um, converge to the mean that you are in, that you're putting in for those land scales 
as opposed to the amount. Oh, I'm, I'm not putting a mean in. I'm not giving it any information about what the length scale is. I, I am putting, the, the length scales are involved in the mean of the Gaussian process, but I'm not giving it in, any information about what I prefer that length scale to be. If I did that, if I took a Bayesian approach and put a prior distribution on those length scales, then all of this bound stuff would be irrelevant. If I, I said I prefer it to be smaller, I give it like a, a, a gamma or an exponential prior, then, um, then all of this is not important. Right, that makes sense. Thanks. That's a, that's a better way to do it, but it's just more, uh, more apparatus than I wanted to go through in, in this deck. Perfect, thanks. All right, so we're, we're pretty much, um, oh, predictive accuracy, two slides left. Why did we do this? We did this because when you, when you use this idea that correlation can decay differently in different input dimensions, you get a much more accurate prediction. So here I've learned that some variables are more useful than others, and I've halved, almost halved, my root mean squared error. So it's quite a bit more accurate. This is the standard uh, setup for Gaussian processes in software. So we've done a lot of cutting and pasting and showing you how it works under the hood with R. You might not be an R programmer, but hopefully you've seen that it's not, we're not talking about thousands of lines of code. We're talking about dozens of lines of code and it's not too bad. You can code it up yourself. I think if you're a Python person, you can get it going pretty quickly, but you don't need to because there are lots of libraries out there that automate these processes for you. And this one that I've shown you, which is a separable Gaussian process with a distance-based correlation is the default in most of the libraries out there. And one of those libraries in R is one that I've written. There are probably 20 that you could choose from in R, but I've written this one and I'm gonna use it for some of the stuff we do in the next slide deck. And it gives basically the same answer. I've called it Bobby. Uh, it's not Bobby, that's not what it's called, but this is my code and this is what I just showed you. And it's more or less the same number. And it does it fast. It actually does it faster than what I just showed you because all of those uh, likelihood calculations and derivatives are, are in C instead of in R. So it's, it's quite a bit faster. So that takes us um, to the end. I was supposed to go to 11.30, I guess. Perfect. Giving us an extra few minutes break. Yeah, if, well, if there are any questions now, this could be a good moment before we go for the break. I would have a short one, but I wanted to see if anyone else. Okay, I have a question that may be relevant also for the, the next sections, which is it's so basic that you may find it uh, hopefully not too silly. Can you distinguish please between the expressions optimization and inference? Oh yeah, great question. Um, whew, uh, for many things that we do in statistics, there is um, no difference between inference and optimization because the inference that we're doing requires optimizing something under the hood. Um, so the, there's often an optimization subroutine that's going on. If you optimize the right thing, then that thing might have some properties that you would call inference. For example, if you optimize a log likelihood, then you can use lots of results from statistics that allow you to characterize uncertainty in your estimate from that optimized log likelihood. So, um, you know, we know that optimized log likelihoods have Gaussian distributions with covariance matrices that come from the Fisher information that has come from the second derivative of the log likelihood. So you use the first derivative to optimize and the second derivative tells you about uncertainty. As you know, the second derivative tells you about curvature. So uncertainty is intimately linked with curvature. So they're the same thing in many cases. Now, if you're taking a Bayesian approach and you're not maximizing the likelihood, then chances are you're also not optimizing. You're sampling instead. Um, so those, those two different regimes, I guess, of inference. Likelihood-based inference is sometimes optimized, sometimes um, 
optimizing the likelihood and Bayesian inference is often not optimized. It's just sampling, but both involve the likelihood. Okay, great. So maybe the one, the, um, the two opposing terms, one may say is optimization versus sampling and both things can be used for inference. That's right. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, on that note, if there are no other questions, then we can break. Oh, there is a question by Andrew. Hi, uh, interesting talk. Um, I don't know if this is a, a silly question, but I'm curious. Um, so when we've sort of arrived at our uh, sort of uh, model for the, the underlying function. So like, for example, when we're looking at um, what the, like when we had the sample points that represented the Gaussian, or excuse me, the sine curve, and it looked kind of like a sine function. Is there some rigorous way of going from, wow, this Gaussian process produces something like a sine, it must be a sine. Like, is there some kind of rigorous way of going from a Gaussian process to uh, some other model? I'm curious. Um, I don't know of anything. I, I, I can think of something you might do. So if, if you wondered if your function was a sine function, um, you could build a, a covariance structure that leveraged that. So what does that mean? You could build periodic effects into your distance function. So um, they could be, two points could be, well, maybe I should just uh, like scroll back to one of those sinusoids. So you could be, build something periodic into your distance structure, which would allow, um, allow points that are here to be correlated with points that are here, right? Right now, the points that are here have almost zero correlation with points that are here. But if you believe that it was periodic, like a sine would be, and in particular, if you thought it was a sine, as opposed to like a cosine or some other phase of a periodic function, you could encode that in your distance structure so that these points here would be highly correlated with those. And then you could compare the two fits, the fit that doesn't use that information to the fit that does. And then there are standard tests like likelihood ratio tests and statistics that would allow you to adjudicate that, to decide whether or not you thought the extra information was useful or not. Okay, we have also one question that came through Discord. Uh, Andrew, is that, does that answer your question? Okay, I'll read the, the next question here. That is, how do we know that the hyperparameters we choose are physically valid? Your example explained how to tune the hyperparameters to achieve the best fit, but that might introduce or remove features that are real. Yes, great point. So. In fact, these hyperparameters, I think of having, I think of them as having no physical bearing on the problem. They're, they're, um, of course, that maybe they have some relationship to some part of your process that does have physical meaning, but I think it would be tenuous at best. I would try not to interpret the values of these parameters at all. However, if, if you do know something about your process, and you can include that in the model, then you can then you might be able to interpret those parameters. Like the best example would be, let's say you know that your function is, um, um, let's say you know it's unimodal or something. You know, like it goes up and then comes back down, right? So or you know that it's monotonic, it just goes up, or something like that. You could encode that into your kernel structure. And you could, you could put, also put it into the mean part of the Gaussian process. And you could try to learn any of the parameters that govern that. And then I think you could ascribe them some meaning. If you, I, I think I'm giving kind of a wishy-washy answer. I think I wanna back up and say, in what I just showed you, I wouldn't try to interpret any of the parameters. But if you wanted to put more information in and parameterize it, I think you could trust the estimates of those parameters if you did it in the right way. Okay, more on that in the next section, I think, on surrogate modeling and vision optimization. So we can break here for.